thank you, Carol. I mean, it's always a great opportunity to talk here. I am also a board member of the museum, so it's sort of a double pleasure uh, to give a book talk here. And I do thank all of you for coming. We could not anticipate that this would be a critical well, series game. I actually love baseball. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I appreciate you all you know, coming here. Um, you know, as Carol mentioned, this book was a long time in the making. Um, uh, I, I actually get engaged in writing current history, uh, doing the process, you know, writing and research and writing while the, the story is actually unfolding. And it's sort of not the easiest thing one could choose to do, but uh, it sort of chose me. Uh, but my goal here was to capture history in the making. Um, and one of the, pro one of the, the opportunities if, when you start early at a project of this scale is that you interview people before their perceptions of what they've done has changed because they're always kind of revisionist stories, uh, you know, 10 years after. And, and a lot, unlike, you know, real historians who have papers, a lot of the materials that's involved in these large-scale projects is not available. Um, the public documents are available, but the recall that historically may have been written doesn't get written, especially in real estate. So, you know, starting early had, it, had its advantages. And my first interviews were dated in 2003. Um, I didn't have to be in a hurry on this, on this project because I knew, I, you knew it was going to take at least 10 to 15 years. 10 would have been a miracle. 15 is, would still set a pace that's much faster than the way these projects typically get built. Um, so that, that was my goal, was to capture history in the making. Um, uh, one of the things that's so clear about this project is that within the historical context of New York City's economic and social trajectory, rebuilding ground zero in that historical context was fraught with strategic significance, because as many of you uh, here will remember the building of the World Trade Center in the 1960s was supposed to resuscitate the founding business district of uh, the city. And it was not the first attempt to revitalize Lower Manhattan, but surely it was the most significant in terms of scale. And so 40 years later, rebuilt, is this the pointer piece? Ah, okay. 40 years later, this is an image, uh, March 2001, and this is September 17, 2001. So 40 years later, rebuilding this site was just fraught with you know, meaning because the whole geopolitical context of the times had changed with 9-11. Um, the destruction of the World Trade Center created a unbelievably rare opportunity for the city to uh, rethink its long-term economic and social needs, at least in the downtown area. And of course, soon after the event, President George Bush promised $20 billion to the city, and that's a rare, you know, kind of, you know, pot of money for any city to get. Now, it's true what they say in the current environment that Schumer and Clinton had to fight hard, really hard, to actually get the money. It was a promise, but the promise, you know, had to go through the appropriations process uh, in Congress. And uh, there are plenty of people who still believe that New York need anything, and, and our senators and representatives certainly felt that they had to get it right away because if they didn't get it right away some other calamity might happen and then the money might not be there so it, it really was a struggle that's the struggle is recounted in chapter four of the book but it's it you know promises are never real until the money's appropriated um, so this was really an unparalleled opportunity for the city to think big in a way that it might otherwise not uh, and so the story of rebuilding Ground Zero, uh, which is really epic, um, uh, was formed by this conjunction of tragedy and opportunity. 
And that kind of tension between recognizing the, tra strategy, the, the tragedy of what happened that day when 3,000 people were mass murdered and the opportunity that came with the uh, massive amount of funds, but also the fact that you don't, you don't level, not, not in the post-Robert Moses age, you don't <laughs> level uh, uh, 16 acres to just rebuild, okay? Uh, and so the scale that was possible of rethinking this area for the 21st century, both in terms of the social needs of Lower Manhattan, which was already changing uh, before 9-11 in terms of its social and demographic makeup. So um, there are many aspects of the book I could talk about. You know, 700 pages, you could go on for hours. Um, but in, in the time I have, I just want to give you some sense of why I wrote it, what it covers, and, and discuss the sort of three central tensions that shape rebuilding. There are many revelations here, and I do have a website. I mean, I've gotten into the modern age, and I have a website, and it's actually pretty substantive, and it talks about a lot of the revelations in, in the book. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. Uh, what did I set out to do? My craft as a scholar has always been to sort of tell the story of how cities revitalize themselves. And for me, that has, from the days I was a PhD student, focused on the issue of implementation. You know, this is the site. Uh, Mar I'm sorry for the blurriness, I, not the highest resolution. March 2002. And, and on the right is the sketch of Daniel Liebskin's Memory Foundation's master plan. What I'm interested in is telling the story of how you go from that to what we see today. Because plans, in my way of thinking about it, are kind of a platform for discussion. They always get modified by uh, changes in the market, by the politics of the situation. And, um, and, and the detailing that gets involved in going from that kind of, of image to, to reality. So that's what I'm interested in, in sort of the politics of how things actually happen uh, from, you know, the very, from the very beginning. In telling, in telling this story, I really aimed for breadth. Um, I wanted readers to understand how the forces of ambition and money and ego shaped the various tangents of this story. Um, so unlike earlier books that were written uh, on the World Trade Center, which focused on design and architecture, I sort of left, you know, that when you're, when you're focused on implementation, you're starting from where that story ends. So um, pretty much the, you know, I started in 2002 as part of a, a, a three-year project the Russell Sage Foundation had sponsored um, on recovery and rebuilding, and I was part of the politics team. And I wrote an essay on the politics of planning in 2004, and I said to the president of the foundation, this is going to take a while. <laughs> you know, this is really a book, book treatment, but it's going to take a while. But so that's, I did start that, that early. And, um, and I just followed the project as, as it evolved. But I really did not pick up uh, uh, a deep engagement in it till about 2007, 2008. I had been following events and developing a chronology. I mean, one of the ways that I get my arms around a project of this uh, complexity is I have a very detailed chronology of events. Um, and, you know, the chronology now is probably 100 pages single spaced. I mean, you know, it's just massive. Uh, because otherwise, I, you don't understand the, I can't understand the flow. So, anyway, it, I just been, this has been a part of my life for a very long time. Not too long, but a long time. So one of the, the most interesting aspects of this is that the rebuilding defined a whole new situation after 
And it's really a story about a compelling public interest. You know, that there's a dual mandate to both remember the 3,000 who were mass murdered and to rebuild for an economic future. And these two are always in tension, these kind of twin, twin mandates. Um, but the compelling public interest of um, you know, the families of those who were murdered and the need to remember them created a compelling public interest that took precedence over prevailing property rights. Now that's very unusual, and in New York it's especially unusual because you know, in the country, property, pro property rights are sacrosanct. But, you know, here you had a situation six weeks earlier, the Port Authority, which owned the land, had privatized the, set, the complex to Larry Silverstein Investment Partnership. So you had these two sets of property interests, the Port Authority, and this is an image from April 4th, 1973, of the dedication of, of the World Trade Center. And the image on the right is July 2001 of Larry Silverstein proudly holding the keys, his uh, Ampataki smiling in the background. I can't remember who's sort of in the background there who's hidden. But these are the two prevailing property interests and also Westfield had the retail interest. And they had to basically submerge or defer their property interests until the um, to the, inter the, the compelling public interest of rebuilding the site. And the property interests actually do prevail, but they get amended, and that, that's a whole different story. But the, 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 the edit, the, these are the twin mandates, and this, I love, I mean, I spent a lot of money, or at least my research fund spent a lot of money uh, getting the right images, because the, the editorial cartoons say things that are, are much more effective than, than words. And this is sort of the way, this is sort of the mentality where people were so uncertain about what was going to happen here because you had these very, these very two tensions. In conventional situations, okay, the rights issue would be discussed and debated as part of an established planning and regulatory process. But there was nothing regular uh, uh, about rebuilding the Trade Center. And the Trade Center, of course, was exempt from that kind of systematic process. And though Governor Pataki uh, created the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, that was not a substitute for a kind of deliberate process. And so for years, chaos and uncertainty prevailed. I mean, for at least until 2006. It was nobody knew who was in control. And the truth of the matter is nobody was in control. Pataki wasn't even in control. And what you had was a series of dueling interests. This is one of my favorite cartoons because you have to sort of notice the scale of the different people. Pataki is large and he actually controlled much of the reins of power, although he did not use them in the most you know, expeditious way. Bloomberg and the city had no formal powers on the site, none. Okay. There were a few streets in the 16 acres that the Port Authority mistaking in the eminent domain uh, procedure of the 60s. So the city had a lever over the streets. And there's Joe Seymour, who's head of the Port Authority. And everybody else is dueling. And that's sort of what, what, it, that's sort of what it was like. Okay. Um, and, and so that from my perspective, the story of rebuilding was a story of power politics between all of these competing <coughs> government entities and private, and private players. There is private money in here. It's just not. Because, this is the point I said, because the city and the state wanted the commercial section built as fast as possible, the only way that was going to happen was to provide public subsidies. And they are a direct government grants. I have a, a chart in there um, in chapter, let's say, 19 or so, that lays out the costs of the towers, the public subsidies in the towers. It's graphic, so it's easy to understand. Um, but because this, the public sector wanted it built right away, the investors, private investors, wouldn't buy those bonds without deep credit support because there weren't tenants. I mean, in Tower 4, 
as part of the of of, of one of the transactions, Port Authority took Port of the public the public tenancy in Tower Four was fifty percent of the office space. Okay, that is not. That doesn't, that's not a validation of the market wanting to be in lower Manhattan. Only when Condé Nast comes do you have a credible private tenant that has made a decision to come to lower Manhattan. But then and again, Condé Nast, just as in Times Square, got an incredible sweetheart deal. Okay. So, you know, the way the public sector will look at this is to say, we're in here for the long term. We are, we are funding economic development, you know, once the memorial's out of it. You couldn't use the words economic development about rebuilding here because, again, it was the tension between the dual mandates, remembrance and rebuilding. But once, but once, but it was economic development, okay? And this was a real estate development project, despite, it was also a lot of, a lot of other things. But that's what the public Senate wanted, and it was a big fight from 2008 to 2010 between the Port Authority and uh, Silverstein with the backing of Bloomberg. Uh, but um, the public sector financed basically two of the three Silverstein buildings. I don't think that's this, as, as problematic as the $4 billion cost for this. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, it would be nice to have had at least a billion of it for Penn Station or some other, you know. We're the only city in the world that doesn't have a train to the airport, okay? There are things we actually need instead of a marble white, a white marble palace. But, you know, don't get me started. Yeah, uh, uh, let me just make sure that nobody else has another question before I give you a second question. <laughs> Speaking of airports, if Bloomberg had been successful in trading the airports, the city owned airports, to the Port Authority, then you could have an entirely, could you imagine what could have happened? Then you could have had a real planning process, right? The, this gentleman is referring to what's called the land swap proposal that Doc Roth put forth in uh, sometime in 2002. And for eight months, the city and uh, and the Port Authority considered swapping the land underneath the Port Authority, uh, underneath the World Trade Center, which the Port Authority owned, for the land underneath LaGuardia and Kennedy Airports, which the city owned, and has at least to the Port Authority. And um, they went at it for quite a while. Uh, there are a lot of different stories about this. But after eight or nine months, it collapsed because Pataki didn't want it to go forward which you can understand, he would have been giving up the power base, okay? It was not ever a good economic deal for the city, but it was a political deal that would have put the rebuilding process in, in the city's hands. I mean, it, it is, I mean, it's an odd situation. You have, this is, this is the DNA of the city, geographically speaking, uh, part of the DNA, and yet you know, the city has no control over it except use the, the streets as, as a lever. So when I asked Joe Seymour uh, about this situation, and I spoke to, you know, I spoke, I, I usually had a verified story with lots of people. So Joe, Joe I said, why did, why did Pataki let it go for eight or nine months? And he said, and he let me put it in the book, he said, because he likes to see the turkeys dance. <laughs> likes to see the what? Likes to see the turkeys dance. So. Um, <laughs> I, I think it was a quip. I think it was, um, well, Pataki is a hands-off, you know, he, right. was, he was only, he was a reactive uh, governor, except yeah. when it came to environmental things. Uh, so, I, you know, I think he just let him. Hi. Yeah, I think he just. Uh, you had a question. You said the clearing of the site uh, came in ahead of schedule. Yeah. What decisions were made that actually made that happen because there were so many forces at play in terms of who wanted materials, what was going to happen with forensic evidence, all of that. And so there was a lot of power structure going on there too. 
I, you know, it, it's a good question. Um, I did not study that. You know, I kind of took off that. And the city was in charge of maybe cleanup and clearance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was, uh, I, I don't know beyond that. Uh, it, it got done in eight months, uh, which was unreal. Right, because I, I had friends of mine who were some of the pathologists working afterward. And to them, it happened about two years faster than it should have because of the process of gathering evidence. Yeah. And they said that they, there was that protocol. That had they followed that protocol, that site should have taken well, two you know, years to clear. It, that, I, I, I have no basis on which to challenge that. Right. It sounds, definitely sounds plausible. And it's, it goes to the point I'm making that there was this push to move right. fast yeah. for all sorts of all sorts of reasons. And um, you know the, the issues of the remains of fresh kills. I mean, there just there are lots of lots and lots of issues that um, uh, came about because of the rapidity. One of the things um, you said about, about moving fast, and um, I know that you admire the role of Chris Ward when he um, ran the Port Authority, well, the World Trade Center director, and finishing the site for the 10th anniversary. And uh, I also agree with you that getting up to ground level was half, half of the job of putting the buildings visibly, or the memorials, on, you know, um, back onto the site. But Chris always talks about how he had to turn the project upside down and build from the top down, and that that was enormously expensive. But it was because of the necessity of speed. Do you you follow? Um, do you agree with that explanation? Well, uh, one, nobody believed anything was happening because I couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. That was number one because it was all going on underground. Okay, and if you can't see anything, then you think nothing's happening. And so that, and, and, and that's really, you know, in the 2006 agreement, they have a realignment of who's going to do what. 2008, nobody's seeing anything anymore. And, you know, the 10th anniversary is creeping up. And that's a very symbolic, don't ask where, why 10 is symbolic, but it is symbolic, okay? And, and, and once, once Patterson comes into office, which is Patterson of West Chris Ward, to head the Port Authority. The pol politicians, Patterson and Bloomberg, and it's unclear as to who pushed sooner. I think it was Bloomberg, but you know, they, they, nobody's, they're not fighting over credit for this. They say it's got to, we have to have the memorial done by the 10th anniversary. This becomes a political push. And, and in order to do that, okay, because of the, because of the, I, I don't have an image here, but because of the path mezzanine. The path mezzanine, in other words, this, this, this is what we see when you go into the transportation. The path trains come in like this, okay, underground. Same configuration as before. This part of the memorial quadrant is the roof of the path mezzanine space, okay? So in order to build this plaza, they had to build the roof first instead of going from the bottom up down. And the number that I've always seen, the, the cost of pushing that forward for the 10th anniversary and delaying other things is a $75 million charge. Honestly, in the four billion dollar figure, <laughs> seventy-five million doesn't doesn't seem that big to you. You know, it is an expensive cost, but that also includes, you know, all the security they had to set up while the site was under construction, so people could visit it from the tenth anniversary on before they removed all the construction. You know, all of all of that's boiled into the seventy-five million. Again, so, yeah, I'm a professor at Columbia has a keen sense of both politics and urbanism. She wrote Times Square Roulette, the definitive work on the rebuilding of Times Square. 
With Power at Ground Zero, she covers 15 years of building and building and, um, of battling and building in, oh, 900 pages? Well, the 200 of documentation. Okay, nine, uh, so yeah, 700 of text and 200 of documentation um, of extraordinary, in, oh, I should say this more slowly, of extraordinary and insightful detail portraying through the primary documents and interviewing many of those involved. And it goes, goes on and on. Um, so, uh, but, and I'll let her go on and on now rather than <laughs> me continue with that. <laughs> so, Lynn. <laughs>